Hello! Welcome to the June virtual installment of our monthly true crime series that is usually held at our downtown library on the second Thursday of each month. My name is Jenna Whittington and today I'll be telling you the horrifying story of the radium painters, the women doomed to die, the living dead society, the radium girls. A story of beauty, deceit, and death. Radium was discovered by Marie Curie and her husband Pierre in 1898. Marie was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize and later was the first person and only woman to win two Nobel Prizes, one in physics and one in chemistry. Her development of the theory of radioactivity ultimately caused her death as she died due to years of radiation exposure in 1934. In the early 1900s, many products, some containing radium and some not, claimed radium could kill cancer cells, give glowing skin, and reclaim youth. Food products like radium butter and chocolate were popular as well as toothpastes and other beauty supplies claiming radium as a main ingredient. During World War I, the need arose for soldiers to be able to see their watches in the trenches without revealing their positions. Radium gave off a dull glow beneficial to the soldier, but not the enemy. The U.S. military contracted watch companies to produce watches with radium dials. An estimated 4,000 workers were hired by corporations in the U.S. and Canada to paint watches with radium. Enter the radium girls. First of all, the women in each facility were told the radium paint was harmless. They were required to use the lip dip paint technique to point their paint brushes. They created a precise tip on their paint brushes with their mouths, dipped in the paint, painted the dial, then back in their mouths to sharpen the point. They were instructed to use this technique because using rags or water was a waste of materials. Because the radium girls were young and had been told the radium paint was harmless, they were known to paint their fingernails, their faces, and teeth with the glowing substance. Some would sprinkle the paint on their clothes. Each painter mixed her own paint in a small crucible and used a camel hair brush to apply the paint. Each girl earned a penny and a half per dial and painted up to 250 dials a day. Watch dials were painted with self-luminous paint in three different United States radium factories. Many of the girls began to suffer multiple illnesses such as anemia, severe fatigue, bone fractures, and necrosis of the jaw now known as radium jaw. The watch dial companies rejected claims that their afflicted workers were suffering from radium exposure. These companies were able to pay off medical professionals and researchers to not release any data connecting the employees' medical conditions to radium exposure. Deaths were recorded as being caused by sexually transmitted diseases, such as syphilis, in an attempt to smear the reputation of these young women. Keep in mind that for these young women to have a job outside of the home at this time in history was huge. United States Radium Corporation, originally called Radium Luminous Material Corporation, was in Orange, New Jersey from 1917 to 1926. They were a major supplier of radioluminescent watches to the military. They employed over 100 workers, mainly women, Assuring the women they were safe, the male owners and scientists of the company avoided radium exposure by using masks, 
lead screens, and tongs. Grace Fryer was a supporter of women's rights, a driving force for equality, and a dial painter at the U.S. Radium Corporation. After falling ill, she had been examined by Dr. Frederick Flynn, not a licensed physician, but a toxicologist who was employed by U.S. Radium. He gave her a clean bill of health. Because the abuse at the U.S. Radium Corporation became so widely covered by newspapers, Grace Fryer decided to sue. Women employed by the U.S. Radium Corporation, dubbed the Radium Girls, joined Grace's efforts. Grace Fryer, Edna Hussman, Catherine Schaub, and sisters Quinta McDonald and Albina Larice sued. It took two years to find a lawyer that would take on U.S. Radium. This case was popularly known as the case of five women doomed to die. And due to the slow-moving courts, encouraged by big money to throw off the media, and with the hopes that the girls would die first. In January 1926, two of the women were bedridden, and none of them could raise their arms to take the oath. Turns out, many of the judges were stockholders in U.S. Radi radium contributing to the delay. It's been stated that this case is, and I quote, one of the most damnable travesties of justice, end quote. This case brought to light the rights of individual workers who contract occupational diseases, but because the New Jersey Occupational Injuries Law only had a two-year statute of limitations, they ended up settling out of court in 1928. This case helped change industrial law governing labor safety standards and holding companies responsible for their employee safety. Cecil Drinker was hired by U.S. Radium after the explosion of media coverage to evaluate the factory for possible improvements and safety. Drinker found several violations and made many recommendations for improvements, but all were ignored. The company was angry with Drinker that he could not be bought. In 1925, U.S. Radium rewrote his claim, stating the factory and all employees were in perfect health and employed in safe conditions. They published this claim still using Drinker's name. Drinker found out and threatened to publish his original re report. U.S. Radium threatened to sue. The Radium Dial Company in Ottawa, Illinois, began in 1922. These women began showing signs of radium poisoning in 1926, but were unaware of the court cases against the U.S. Radium Corporation in New Jersey. Radium Dial authorized toxicity tests for the ill women, but never informed the women of the deadly results. But knowing the results, the company introduced glass pins to be used instead of the camel hair paintbrushes. The women found the pens to be slowing their productivity, resulting in less pay. So they went back to the paintbrushes and the lip dip paint technique. When the Ottawa women learned of the New Jersey lawsuit, they began to question their employer. They began asking for compensation for their medical and dental bills in 1927, but were refused. This continued through the mid-1930s. The company dismissed the New Jersey lawsuits because the women were only, and I quote, showing signs of viral infections end quote, or STDs, and assured the Ottawa women of their safety. In 1937, five women employed at the Radium Dial Company sued and won damages in 1938. The women were led by Catherine Donahue, who weighed 60 pounds when she died of radiation poisoning and was buried in a lead-lined coffin. The case was ruled in the women's favor, but was appealed eight times by Radium Dial. The case was won all eight times before Radium Dial was forced to pay the women compensation. Unfortunately, after medical and legal fees and shortened lives, 
the women did not see much compensation. In the end, the radium dial company's final comment was, and I quote, We unfortunately gave work to a great many people who were physically unfit to procure employment in other lines of industry. Cripples and persons similarly incapacitated were engaged. What was then considered an act of kindness on our part has since been turned against us. End quote. Jerks. The Waterbury Clock Company in Waterbury, Connecticut, um, was another plant involved in this deceit. Frances Spletschotter, a woman in her early 20s, was the first to die in the Waterbury Radium Girls tragedy. She suffered the common symptoms of radium poisoning, such as anemia, sore throat, deteriorating jaw, soft teeth, spontaneous bone fractures, and aches. Although Waterbury Clock Company officials were beginning to understand the effects of radium on their workers, they rejected the company's connection to Francis's death, but later discouraged lip dipping after 1925. Just four years later, 22-year-old Mildred Cardow died from working with radium at the Waterbury Clock Company. The following year, Mary Damulus, also in her early 20s, died due to lip dipping. This finally motivated the Waterbury Clock Company to forcefully denounce lip dipping in their factory. After 1926, it became evident that radium at the Waterbury Clock Company caused illnesses and deaths among their workers. Between 1926 and 1936, the company issued over $90,000 in medical settlements. Due to these expenses, the company decided to change its qualifications for workers' compensation. In 1927, a woman now had only three years to file a claim, rather than the typical five. This change did not affect some of the women, however, because their symptoms became evident in a very rapid fashion. But most of the women did not see the effects of lip dipping until long after the five-year requirement, when they developed cancer. This did not only affect workers in Connecticut, but also Illinois and New Jersey, where both states lost 30 to 40 women due to lip dipping. In 1941, the Waterbury Clock Company decided to address some of their employees' concerns, and due to the risks employees faced on the job, the company agreed to the union agreed with the union to increase wages by 2 cents. Wow. The tragic story of the Radium Girls helped build a nation. As World War II approached, the women were essentially test subjects to the repercussions of radium exposure. According to the U.S. Atomic Bomb Commission, I quote, If it hadn't been for those dial painters, thousands of workers might well have been and might still be in great danger. End quote. These young women, those who died and those who led long, painful lives, helped aid U.S. forces in World War II. The Radium Girls paved the road for both health, physics, and labor rights. Because of these women, individual workers have the right to sue for damages from corporations due to labor abuse. Industrial safety standards have dramatically improved. The subsequent radium dial painters were instructed in proper safety precautions and provided with protective gear, and they no longer were required to lip dip paint, although radium paint was used on dials through the 1960s. The lawsuits and publicity helped to establish occupational disease labor laws we now use today. And that is the horrifying story of the radium painters. 
the women doomed to die, the Living Dead Society, the Radium Girls. Thank you for listening, and remember to tune in next month for July's installment of True Crime Stories.